natural law, pluralism, refuted number nine. Natural law, pluralism, refuted number nine. And our topic today, in both messages, will be Van Drunen on natural law and the Mosaic law. And uh, Westminster Seminary has more in common with Dallas Theological Seminary than it does with the Westminster Standards. And I'll prove that today. Uh, their views of the law are extremely unscriptural and uh, to be avoided. <clears throat> but I'll be reading from Psalm 119. Starting at verse 9. How can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word? With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of my, your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies. And down to verse 26. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts. I will meditate on your wonderful works. And it goes on that for the longest psalm in the Old Testament. <clears throat> so last week we looked at Van Drunen's unique understanding of the Noahic Covenant. And I deemed that his positive, that's his, his positive argument for natural law, which is essentially an argument from silence. Uh, but he also has a unique understanding of the Mosaic Covenant. Although uh, Van Drunen writes in a way that is ambiguous at times, unnecessarily intellectual, and difficult to understand, and often contains words that give him a plausible deniability if he is challenged, for example, may corroborate, seems to be, the text implicitly suggests, this account suggests, we may tentatively conclude, suggests a thicker ethical task. These considerations suggest, several considerations suggest a richer and thicker ethic, etc. We can discern a number of erroneous teachings regarding his view of the Mosaic Law. <clears throat> and his view has nothing to do with the Westminster Standards whatsoever. First, um, there are a number of teachings regarding, uh, erroneous teachings regarding his view of the Mosaic Law. First, he essentially denies that anything within the Mosaic Law should be used outside of the Christian Church. Okay, and I'll mention this uh, later, but his view, his two-kingdom theory, is much more unbiblical and much more radical than the old Lutheran two-kingdom view. Uh, the kingdom of the right hand, the kingdom of the left hand, developed by Luther. At least Lutherans would say, well, you know, the church shouldn't tell the civil magistrate what to do. Uh, but Christians can apply the moral laws found in the Old Testament to the civil government. They would say that. You know, you know as a Christian, you should try to apply the moral laws found in the Old Testament. Uh, Van Drunen doesn't even agree with that. <clears throat> He holds to a modified form of dispensationalism as the law's binding authority outside of Israel and its application to society. He writes, this is from 297. One thing seemed clear, seems clear is that the Mosaic Law's civil provisions are so organically intertwined with Israel's identity as God's covenant people and with their obligation to worship him in their distinctive way that any sweeping claim that the Mosaic civil laws should be imposed by civil communities today who are not in relationship to God through the covenant at Sinai is fundamentally misguided. Okay, and we'll look at that in a second, but that's a very deceptive. No, nobody's saying that we should adopt everything. We're not, you know, the Anabaptists at Munster. We're not, nobody claims that. Nobody wants to adopt everything. The thing is, is are there moral things there that should be adopted? That's the issue. Continuing, applying the Mosaic laws as a whole only makes sense within the context of the Mosaic Covenant. And it is presumptuous for any nation other than the Old Testament Israel to act as though it is in covenant with God through Moses. End of quote. Now, if Van Druden was arguing that no nation today can or should simply adopt the whole civil code of Israel, I heartily agree. No theonomist, not one. No theonomist argues that we should simply adopt every civil law in the Mosaic Code. 
only civil laws that are moral in content, that is, moral natural laws uh, that are based on God's nature and character, they, they obviously apply. You know, don't trip a blind man. Uh, love your neighbor. Don't gossip about him behind his back, but go to him in person. All these, there's tons of laws in the Mosaic Code that are not the Ten Commandments. They're obviously moral, natural laws. They're moral in content. They're based on God's nature and character. <clears throat> and, of course, moral positive laws that are universal. That is, they're general. They apply to all nations. And the great example of that, of course, is the incest regulations of Leviticus chapter 18. Uh, they apply to all nations. And they're not moral natural laws because Adam and Eve's children had to marry each other. They're moral positive laws. And, of course, the particular day of the Sabbath, that's a moral positive law. Civil laws that are positive and peculiar to Israel or ceremonial, obviously, are temporary and no longer binding. And how do we know which laws are temporary and which laws are moral natural and which laws are moral positive? How do we know? You have to go to Scripture and study what the Scripture says. The Scripture will tell you. And, of course, this view is the position of the Westminster Divines and modern theonomists such as Greg Bonson. And let me just say something about the general equity clause, which is always misinterpreted, almost always misinterpreted today. Although the general, general equity clause in the Westminster Confession, that's 29.4, usually is viewed today as teaching a radical discontinuity between in the Old New Covenant eras and the judicial laws of Israel, such thinking is clearly an error. The judicial laws as a body politic, that is a distinctive body of laws for Israel, has expired. Okay, as a system, as a whole body of law, it has expired. Yes, that's true. Israel doesn't exist. Now, we have modern secular Israel, but that's not the same as the old covenanted nation. Israel as a covenanted nation or peculiar people no longer exists, and the Old Testament law order as a distinct law order obviously no longer applies to any nation. But the Confession teaches that whatever contains general equity within that code still applies today. The term general equity, well, the term general, what does it mean? It means universal. If you study how it was used back then, that's what it means. It means universal. There are laws within the Mosaic Code that apply universally. They apply to all mankind. Don't commit murder. Don't steal. Uh, don't commit rape or sodomy or uh, bestiality. These are, these are universal laws. They're general equity laws. They're, they're universal. So there are some laws in the Mosaic Code that apply to all men. The Ten Commandments are obvious examples. And so are the laws on homosexuality, rape, manslaughter, bestiality, fraud, theft, causing an abortion. The incest laws in Leviticus 18 and 20 are applied by God to the seven Canaanite nations, even though incest laws are positive moral laws, not moral natural laws. And we know this once again because Adam and Eve's children would have had to intermarry in order to bear children and propagate the race. Even if Adam and Eve have not sinned. Okay, so it can't be a sin... It can't be a moral, natural law for them to get married and have children because God doesn't tell people to commit sin, and they would have had to do that even if Adam and Eve have not fallen to fulfill the dominion mandate. A time came in history where God forbade incest within the degrees of consanguinity revealed in Leviticus 18. The word equity refers to what is just, righteous, and fair. In fact, I should have looked in the old King James in one of the Psalms. Equity is used in a poetic parallel with the word justice. Any laws in the judicial code of Moses that are righteous or just in content, in content are universal, according to the confession. They cannot be set aside or abrogated, according to the confession. They are all still binding today, <coughs> according to the confession of faith. This view is proved by how the larger catechism uses moral case laws in the Mosaic Law outside the Ten Commandments to flesh out and define the meaning of each commandment. Note also that the general equity clause in the Confession is, uh, proof, uh, uses as a proof text Matthew 5.17 where Jesus says that the moral law abides in the New Covenant era continually. 
Look, I didn't come to get rid of the law. I've come to fulfill it. Now, I fulfilled the ceremonial law in that it, it typified his death, and that obviously doesn't continue. But the moral law is not abrogated. I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. The, the moral law continues. That text would be totally inappropriate if they were abrogating or teaching a radical discontinuity of everything within the judicial law, because there's many moral laws in the judicial law. It is also proved by how the early Presbyterians and Puritans in New England comprised their own laws. In addition, a reading of Second Reformation Presbyterians, at least three members of the Westminster Assembly, reveals that these churchmen often appealed directly to Old Testament moral statutes and case laws, laws outside the Ten Commandments and their penalties. Here's an example, and here's a great Samuel Rutherford, who's one of the, one of the chief men of the, that second generation of Presbyterians. In a discussion of toleration, he says this quote, this is from his a free disputation against pretended liberty of conscience. Quote, it is clear the question must be thus stated, for all the laws of the Old Testament, which, which we hold in their moral equity to be perpetual, that are touching blasphemies, heresies, solicitation to worship false gods, and the breach of what the godly magistrate was to punish, command or forbid, only such things as may be proved by two or three witnesses, and which husband and wife are not to conceal, and from which all Israel must abstain for fear of like punishment. Deuteronomy 13, 8, 9, 10, 11, Deuteronomy 17, 5, and 6, Leviticus 20, verse 1, and 2, 3, 4, 5. But opinions in the mind, acts of the understanding, can never be proved by witnesses, such as neither magistrate nor church can censure. End of quote. So he just played a, a bunch of civil laws, a bunch of moral laws within the civil code. He says, clearly, apply today. And he calls it the moral equity of the law. And then writing about only six years after the Westminster Standards were completed, a Scottish Presbyterian minister, the old famous uh, James Ferguson, uh, 1621 to 1667, speaking of the Mosaic Code, says this, that through these laws, that though these laws were judicial, quote, though these laws were judicial, yet it does not follow that they are not now binding to magistrates. To understand this, that there were two things in the civil laws as in our civil laws. Yet there was something that concerned the kingdom of the Jews in particular as that law, that servants should be freed from their service at the end of seven years and the law of inheritance to be kept within the tribe. And this part of the law, matters of particular equity, did fall with their commonwealth. It was abrogated. But there was another thing in their judicial laws, and that is somewhat of a common or general equity belonging unto all. Such laws as punishing sin stunts against the moral law. And in this far, the judicial law is binding to us, because there is not a syllable in the New Testament for abrogating it. And so it must bind being given by God. And here's some examples he gives. Quote, that witches should be punished by death and burned to ashes is a civil law in Scotland. Now there is somewhat there of a common equity to wit that they should be punished by death. But the particular way of putting them to death, to wit, whether by strangling, drowning, etc., or the burning of their bodies to ashes, is not of common equity. In other words, the, uh, the universal equity is they have to be put to death. But the way you do it uh, that's peculiar. So you don't have to burn them to death if you don't want to. <clears throat> other kings may use another way of execution as pleaseth them best. He then proceeds to make a second distinction. There are two laws, two things in the law. There is first the substance of the law, secondly the circumstances of it. Now the law may hold according to the main substance, and yet not according to these circumstances. We shall clear it in an example. The law of hospitality binds all nations as to the substance of things commanded by it. But there were some circumstances joined with this law according to the nature of the people to whom it was given, such as the washing of feet and kisses of love or charity. And according to these, it is not biding, binding. And so that command that false worship should be punished is substantial and binding unto all. But that it should so, be so punished as to put children, women, beasts, young and old to death was suited according to the temper of that people unto whom it was given. Being so naturally prone to idolatry and therefore were more, uh, more by the fearful punishments to be scared from it. And so in th that respect is not binding unto others. Okay, so once again, he says the law is binding, but the penalty, the specific penalty 
does not necessarily apply today. We may add where this law is repeated, Exodus 22.18, Deuteronomy 17.5, uh, and chapter 18.20. It is only repeated in the substance of it, and the way and manner is not mentioned. Secondly, we find that Jacob and other magistrates who were before the law did not execute according to uh, these circumstances. Yea, and the Jewish magistrates, as Moses and Josiah, Exodus 31 and 2 Kings 23, did not tie themselves precisely to execute the law according to these circumstances. And so it remains that though these circumstances do not bind the magistrate, yet the law, according to its substance, is yet binding. And that term is a, a brief refutation of the errors of toleration, harassingism, independency, separation delivered in sermons uh, from the years 15, uh, 1652. And I'm just going to quote two because I could quote for four hours, I could quote similar quotes like this. Speaking generally, the original Puritans and Presbyterians held views very similar to modern theonomists, except they were far more consistent and faithful respecting the first table of the law. So, I mean, it's just important to establish that, uh, and I know everybody criticizes modern theonomists, and they, they've done some crazy things, but their general thesis that, look, there's moral laws in these civil codes that we should be following. They're obviously moral in content. You know, things like rape and bestiality and homosexuality. We should follow those today. God gave them. They weren't given by mad. Moses didn't make them up. God gave these laws. God says these laws are just. God says in Deuteronomy 4 or 6 and following, these are an example to the pagan nations around us. We should follow them. That was the position of the Puritans, and that was the position of the early Presbyterians. It is not the position of modern Presbyterians, because they reject covenanting, they reject the implications of the kingship of Christ, and Psalm 2, and Psalm 110, and the Great Commission, and all these things for natural law, pluralism. So that's important to keep in mind. <clears throat> and then I want to say something about uh, Greg Bonson. Van Drunen's book, Natural Law and the Two Kingdoms, a study in the development of uh, reformed social thought on page 409, gives the false impression that Greg Bonson teaches that Israel's judicial law should be the standard for all nations without taking into consideration the fact that many laws are positive and peculiar to Israel. He characterizes, he misrepresents Bonson. Bonson addresses this issue to a degree in, in his uh, chapter called Categories of Old Testament Law in his book, No Other Standard Theonomy and His Critics. It's critics. A Greg Bonson does not believe that things like the year of Jubilee, the lever at marriage, still apply. He teaches that only moral laws or laws that teach universal principles of justice still apply. <clears throat> and of course, uh, Van Drunen makes the, the same erroneous claim on page 297 of his Divine Covenants in Moral Order. He misrepresents the honors. Okay, what, the Anabaptists in Germany uh, said, we need to apply the judicial code. And, of course, they did so very, they adopted all sorts of ceremonial things. They were practicing polygamy. They were doing all sorts of crazy things. And so when you read Calvin slamming the law of Moses and Luther slamming the law of Moses, they were reacting against these Anabaptist heretics who were teaching all kinds of, and doing outrageous things. And we don't want to mix up modern theonomists with these old Anabaptists who were thoroughly unscriptural. You know, there's things in the moral law outside the Ten Commandments, I mean, the law of Moses outside the Ten Commandments that are obviously moral in content, whether nat moral natural or moral positive. And to deny that is, is, and just simply say, well, they were given to Israel, therefore we're going to dismiss all of it, like we're from Dallas Theological Seminary and we're a bunch of dispensationalists. That's neither logical nor scriptural. It's just not a sound way of thinking. It's, it's an excuse to jettison the law of God. Van Drunen has apparently adopted the relatively modern notion that the dividing up of the Mosaic law into different categories, such as moral, civil, and ceremonial, is not warranted and is artificial. This leads him to view the whole Mosaic law as somewhat tainted and inappropriate for all peoples and nations outside of the Christian church. 
He believes that the whole Mosaic, the whole law of Moses, the whole thing should have nothing to do with civil magistrates in the New Covenant era. Nothing. And he even says it's tainted for Christians because it was given to Israel. It's radically dispensational in his thinking. Note, for example, how he speaks of the law regarding sexual morality in Leviticus 18 and 20. He writes, Leviticus 18 and 20 further corroborates my thesis that the moral, that the Mosaic law, in part, communicates the moral substance of the natural law. Now listen to this carefully. In a way appropriate for God's Old Testament people. <laughs> In a way appropriate for God's Old Testament people. Now, of course, he ignores what Leviticus 18 says. God says, look, I destroyed the seven Canaanite nations because they were doing these things. So it obviously applies to them, not just the, not just the Jews. The words in part indicate that Van Drunen does not view the law revealed in special revelation as sufficient. This statement implies that the law revealed through nature is superior, fuller, and more detailed. The statement in a way appropriate for God's people clearly implies that these laws are revealed in a manner that is inappropriate for unbelievers or those outside the church. And you say, come on, aren't you stretching things a bit? No, I'm not, if you read his other statements. In his other book I have, he, he flat out says that uh, since unbelievers don't have the indicatives of the gospel, they don't have the redemptive stuff, then the laws that are given to Christians and given to believers have, have nothing to do with unbelievers. Well, you just threw out virtually every law in the whole Bible. <laughs> you know, basically you're saying they, they only have natural law, as though it's, it's wrong to even apply special revelation to them in any way. <clears throat> If one thinks I am exaggerating or wrong in my conclusion, one only needs to read an earlier work of Van Drunen's to confirm my observation. And here's from his book, A Case for Natural Law, page 40. Here's what he says, quote, Christians cannot rightly appeal to the moral lifestyle set forth in Scripture as directly applicable to non-Christians. Because the redemptive indicatives, and indicative is simply a word for what happens in history. That's crisis per for example, Christ's perfect work of redemption, do not apply to them. The imperatives, that is commands, cannot simply be taken and imposed on them. Thus, although you shall not murder and many other moral imperatives are both known by natural law and revealed in Scripture, Scripture does not provide a common moral standard for Christian and non-Christians in the way that natural law does. End of quote. Now, while we certainly agree that God's covenant people are redeemed and they're in a special covenant relationship with Jehovah, okay, we love God, we, we're, we're God's bride, you know, and thus we want to keep the moral law out of love, honor, and respect, the differences in relationship with God between believer and unbeliever do not affect the content or the standard of God's law whatsoever. Now, remember, I... I dealt with this a long time ago. I'll bring it up once again. The moral law revealed in nature, even though it's because of sin and because nature has fallen, it's, it's not easy to read, but the moral law revealed in nature is identical in content to the moral law revealed in Scripture. There's one God. There's one law. There's two ways of revealing that law. There's natural revelation and there's special revelation. Why do we need special revelation? Because man has fallen and nature is fallen. The, the law revealed in nature is not perspicuous, and it's, you can't read it aright without going to Scripture first to tell you how to read it aright. Okay, are we going to follow the example of the red fire ants who kill all their neighbors? Or, or a wolf pack who rips the sheep to shreds? Or are we going to follow the example of the lowly beaver who builds a nice house and makes a nice little pond for his friends? You see, nature is red in tooth and claw, but we'll get to that more later. Van Drunen needs to explain how the moral laws revealed to Israel are different in content to natural law. He never does. He only discusses a different purpose. If they're the same in content, which is the only rational, scriptural, logical position, then why go to the less perspicuous source? In addition, 
all moral imperatives are God are automatically binding on all humanity because Jehovah is God. He's God. He makes the rules. When he speaks, he speaks with absolute authority. While it is true that various peculiar, non-moral, positive, ceremonial laws did not apply to unbelievers, we know this truth from Scripture. Scripture tells us what is binding. Scripture tells us what is not binding. Scripture tells us what is abrogated. Scripture tells us what continues. Sojourners, non-Jews, living in the land of Israel, were required to obey all the moral requirements, all moral natural laws, and all moral positive laws of the Mosaic Law. But they were expressly forbidden to participate in the ceremonial ordinances unless they first converted to the true religion, the true God, and joined themselves to Israel and were circumcised. You couldn't participate in their version of the sacraments without becoming a Jew. But you still would be put to death if you committed murder or if you advocated idolatry in public and tried to get people to convert to a false god. There's some passages to look up to prove what I just said. Exodus 12:48. Leviticus 22.10, Leviticus 25.35, Numbers 25.15. The only thing that I could find that applied to the sojourners in Israel were the benefits of the year of Jubilee. Leviticus 25.40. It, however, was not a ceremonial cultic law related to worship but a law of mercy ending a period of servitude, so it contained moral aspects. In Exodus, 29, for, uh, Exodus 12, 49, we read, One law shall be for the native-born and for the stranger who dwells with you. So God imposed his revealed moral laws on unbelieving Gentiles. Case closed. Even though they weren't saved by Jehovah, even though they may not have believed in the Christ to come. Even though they didn't have a covenant relationship with Jehovah, they had to obey the moral statutes in the whole law of Moses. Case closed. Of course, he doesn't deal with that. I don't blame it. <clears throat> now, Van Drunen teaches that the whole Mosaic law, including what historically has been called moral laws and moral case laws, is inappropriate as the standard for the Christian church. They're even inappropriate for the Christian church. This is radically unscriptural stuff. On page 363, he says this, quote, Paul's radical break from the world through Christ's cross, Galatians 6.14, is of one piece with his being redeemed by Christ from slavery to the stokia, that's the elements of the world, Galatians 4, 3-5. He's got this really strange view of Galatians. And since Paul's identification with the new creation is the great alternative to belonging to the world, Galatians 6, 14 to 15, Paul must also intend believers' identities, identification with the new creation, to contrast with the slavery to the stokia of the world, Galatians 4, 3, to 9, 3 and 9. Paul was evidently attracted to the phrase, the stokia of the world, Therefore, because he wished to communicate that the Mosaic Law was not a moral standard rooted in the new creation. In other words, the Mosaic Law is import, in important respects is a protological, not an eschatological moral standard. End of quote. And I'll just say, I'm just covering the main things in this book. If I wanted to refute everything in this book that was unbiblical and nonsensical, I would have to write a book as big as this book, and I don't want to do that. I want, to, I want a small thing. You know, the book is just full of garbage. This understanding of Galatians is erroneous and dispensational. In Galatians, Paul is dealing with a few serious Judaizing errors. One was that Gentiles had to become circumcised, follow the ceremonial ordinances, and become a Jew before he could become a true Christian. 
And if you read the book, there's this real focus on circumcision. The Judaizers got to be circumcised. You got to do what we had to do before Christ came to become. You had to become a Jew to become a Christian. <clears throat> now the other problem in Galatians is that Paul deals with is legalism, or the idea that law obedience was necessary for salvation or justification before God. Paul therefore is not criticizing the Old Testament moral law as a standard for a believer's sanctification at all. But the heretical abuses of the Mosaic law. And, you know, in his book, I don't have it here, I think I deal with it later. He sides with the uh, new perspective on Paul authors over the Orthodox position on certain passages. Now, this observation becomes especially evident when we consider the fact that Paul directly quotes an Old Testament moral law outside of the Ten Commandments as binding in Galatians 5.14. For Paul, Christian sanctification is based on the standard of the Old Testament moral law. Van Drunen's view explicitly contradicts the traditional Protestant understanding of the text. For example, William Henderson, Hendrickson, a very able I think he was Christian Reformed, very, very good commentator. Quote, here's what he says, quote, The context in Galatians 3, 3, and 9, see verse 10, and in Colossians 2, 8, and 20, see verses 16, 18, 21 to 23, demands, as I see it, that we interpret these worldly rudiments as elementary teachings regarding rules and regulations, by means of which, before Christ's coming, people, both Jews and Gentiles, each in their own way, attempted by their own efforts, and in accordance with the promptings of their own fleshly, unregenerate nature, to achieve salvation. There was nothing wrong with the law given at Sinai, but when the Jews and the proselytes of the Jewish religion began to look upon law observance as a way wherein salvation could be achieved, and when, with this in mind, the Jewish religion, religious leaders began to add their own multitudinous rules and regulations to those previously received, that law became their tyrant, to which they became enslaved. The same was true with respect to the prescriptions and ordinances by which the worshippers of the pagan deity sought to achieve redemption. By all such means, whether Jewish or pagan, men were putting themselves in bondage. This interpretation is also in harmony with Paul's previous statement, 323. With the coming of Christ and the full light of special revelation which he brought, John 1, 17 and 18, there was even less excuse than there had ever been for this servitude, this catering to false philosophy and empty deceit. To the Colossians, Paul was going to say, If with Christ you died to the rudiments of the world, why, as though you were still living in the world, do you submit to regulations, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that are meant for destruction by their consumption, according to the precepts and doctrines of men? Regulations of this kind, though, to be sure, having a reputation for wisdom because of their self-imposed ritual, humility, and unsparing treatment of the body, are of no value whatsoever, serving only to indulge the flesh. Colossians 2.20-23. Paul wants the uh, end of quote. Imagine Paul calling God's law the rudimentary elements of the world. No, the abuse of God's law is worldly, not the law. Paul says the law is righteous, holy, just, and good in Romans. It is spiritual, Romans 7. All those things are in Romans 7. The law is good. Am I saying the law is bad after condemning the law as a means of salvation? Absolutely not. The law is just, holy, and good. The moral law. Paul wants the Galatians to understand that the law can never serve as a means of redemption and that the beggarly, ceremonial, supervisory elements of the law do not apply to believers after the death and resurrection of Christ. Richard Longnecker says, such to use ta stoikia, tu cosmu, the elements of the world, might well have been coined by Paul himself, as Bo Reich suggests. Thus, when talking about the Jewish experience, it was not the Mosaic, it was the Mosaic law in its condemnatory and supervisory functions that comprised the Jews' basic principles of religion. Later in verse 9, when talking about Gentile experience, it was paganism with its veneration of nature and the cultic rituals that make up the Gentiles' basic principles of religion. It's not the law as a stand, end of quote. It's not the law as a standard of sanctification. I'm talking about the moral law. It's not the moral law as a standard of sanctification that Paul condemns. For like I just said, Paul quotes 
a law outside of the Ten Commandments in Galatians 5 as his springboard for teaching on sanctification. He does it in Romans. The New Testament ethic, the New Testament moral standard, is not built on natural law, contrary to Van Drunen. It is built on the Old Testament moral laws, found within the judicial and uh, the moral law, of uh, the Mosaic law. The moral laws, whether they're judicial or not, whether they're outside the Ten Commandments or not, within the Mosaic Code. That is the foundation, the standard of sanctification. The scriptures teach explicitly that Christians are not under the law as a means of justification or as a condemning document. Okay, the guilt and penalty of the law has been forever removed by the sacrificial death of Christ. All those sins that you've committed, that you deserve to be punished for, that you deserve to go to hell for, were imputed or reckoned to Christ on the cross, and he paid for them in full by his sacrificial death, his suffering, and his vicarious death, and his perfect righteousness was imputed to you. That is, the, the law as a <clears throat> document that you have to fulfill to obtain eternal life, Christ fulfilled that as well, and that's imputed or reckoned to your account. His perfect positive righteousness. They are also not under the ceremonial, typical positive laws that taught an immature people about the Messiah to come and his redemptive work. Okay, the whole ceremonial system has been abrogated. It is done away. It's the shadow. But the moral laws within the Mosaic Law are still binding directly and explicitly to every Christian as a rule of life or sanctification. Okay, here's a law in the Mosaic Code that's not part of the Ten Commandments. Don't trip a blind man. Are we allowed to trip blind men now because it's not, because it's not in the Ten Commandments? It's part of the, the Judicial Code? Well, of course not. What about rape? What about, bla what about blasphemy? What about uh, sodomy? What about uh, bestiality? Are these laws not moral in content? Well, obviously they are. So to say they're not binding is, is totally unscriptural. For this reason, moral laws, Old Testament moral laws, are quoted and applied by the inspired impossibles directly to Christians in a number of epistles. And we'll look at that in a minute. So Van Drunen is outside the pale of Reformed Orthodoxy on the law of God. He should not be classified as a reform scholar, at least on the law, but a neo-evangelical scholar. So he's not even reformed. His views are not reformed. They're not confessional. They're out of accord with the confession of faith. They're out of accord with the larger catechism. They're not biblical. They're not confessional. They're not Presbyterian in the traditional sense, the classical sense of that word. They're not Puritan either. They're new. They're dispensational. They're corrupt. They're a backsliding away from what the Bible teaches. <clears throat> now further, those things associated with natural law that are called creation ordinances, monogamous heterosexual marriage, a six-day work schedule, with one day off for the Sabbath, the requirement to multiply and fill the earth, and the dominion or cultural mandate can really only be, only be learned through special revelation. They can really only be learned through special revelation. We know the earth was created in six days and God rested the seventh day because the Bible says so. The Bible tells us. No scientist can learn this truth by studying his natural surroundings. Nobody was there. They're all dead. Even something as fundamental as marriage between one man and one woman is dependent on special revelation. Polygamy, unfaithfulness, homosexuality and bisexual, bisexuality are common in the fallen natural order, both among animals and birds and people. Thus we need scripture to tell us how uh, to interpret nature. I mean, the bonobos in Africa, they're, they're a species of, uh, they're like a chimp, panzi. The bonobos are bisexual. They commit homosexuality all the time. They masturbate all the time. They're, they're sex addict monkeys. We don't want to imitate them. We have to obey the Bible. Also, how does nature tell us that we need to multiply and spread out? 
This is something that God wants us to do that is not discernible in nature. The earth does not need man to continue or for animals to flourish. The earth can do quite fine on its own. The requirements of fruitfulness and the dominion mandate are usually considered aspects of natural law because they were regarded as creation ordinances. But they are positive moral laws and not natural moral laws. They are tied to God's original creation by special revelation and are not discernible from the fallen order. Modern scientists and secular humanists teach that man is harmful to the environment and thus argue for population control and the need to limit man's spread upon the earth. That's what they get from nature. That's what they get from their version of natural law. They base their conclusions on a study of nature. There's a good reason why our spiritual forefathers insisted upon sola scriptura. We're dependent on scripture for everything, to learn, understand anything. Van Drunen wants the state to be able to avoid the authority of God's revealed law so it can make up its own law. That just happens to completely neglect the whole first table of the law. Remember, natural law, that which is revealed in nature, and that which is revealed in special revelation teach the exact same ethics. They teach the same thing. Exactly. So when Van Drunen says natural law says that we should have pluralism, Van Drunen reveals his true colors. He doesn't like God's law. He doesn't like the law of Moses. He doesn't want to apply it to society. He wants to justify cultural surrender. He wants to justify religious pluralism and blasphemy and idolatry. He's a false prophet for the American civil religion. And he's rejecting scripture to do it. Our nation has been doing, um, neglecting the first table of the law for over 100 years. And the fruit of such labors has been evil and bitter. Our nation has rejected the, the moral law of God as revealed in scripture. He essentially advocates a ceasefire with secular humanists who have been attacking the Christian worldview and any idea of Christian civilization for centuries. Let's have a ceasefire with Satan. He cries, peace, peace, while the atheistic humanists and modernists reload their weapons. He does not realize that because there is no neutrality and the natural man hates God, those who reject God's spoken word will never develop a just, comprehensive, ethical code or judicial system from nature. It's not going to happen. It's never happened. You know, when Calvin praised the law of nations and stuff, that's stupid. That was dumb. I love Calvin. He's way better than I'll ever be. But that's, that's just simply a really dumb statement to make. Sure, there were some good laws. There's a lot of oppression and slavery and face branding and torture. And, you know, the, the, those Roman society, all those societies were founded upon chattel slavery and kidnapping and murder. If a person rejects the perfect and perspicuous source of truth, why would he accept and obey the fallen and non-perspicuous source of truth? If God's spoken word is not the foundation for law and society, then autonomous man's word will be. That's your choice. The stupidity, blindness, and depravity of fallen man's reasonings um, were subdued, mollified, and restrained in America during the 20th century because of the large influence of Christianity on our society. That's why, you know, the, the, all the talk of natural law, it, it kind of works okay as long as everybody holds to the Bible anyway. But as soon as people don't hold to the Bible anymore, our society descends into ethical chaos and viciousness and murder. Think of abortion, for example. <clears throat> Behaviors such as fornication, homosexuality, out-of-wedlock births, adultery, unlawful divorce, and so on were kept, were kept deep in the closet as best as possible because of society's disapproval certain civil laws, and the shame associated with such behaviors. Now, Hollywood in the 1920s, they were fornicating and committing adultery and doing all their crazy things and out get, getting drunk and on a rampage like they do now. But back then, they had to hide it all. They had to hide it all. 
because of the influence of Christianity on our, on our culture. But now that that influence is largely gone, it's all out in the open. The Christian influence has been greatly degraded since the 1960s. If Van Drunen thinks that a revival of natural law will remedy the current situation, he's wrong and he's deluded. The Word of God gives us the answer, for it recognizes the vanity and foolishness of unbelieving thought and tells us, 2 Corinthians 10.5, to cast down imaginations, that is reasonings, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, that we may bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The pluralist is unwilling to admit publicly one of the fundamental principles of the Bible. There is an irreconcilable conflict in history and in all of man's institutions between God and Satan, covenant keepers and covenant breakers, spiritual light and spiritual darkness. There's an antithesis. Van Til emphasized this. Greg Bonson emphasized this. R.J. Rushton emphasizes this. Van Drunen ignores it. Therefore, we must not place our hope in unregenerate man's ability to read fallen nature correctly. Earlier we saw in our foundational topics, we saw that autonomous human reason cannot be trusted to tell us the truth of, uh, about uh, any truth of ultimate concern, meaning, or justice. They get things right once in a while, but only on a surface level. We must place all of our hope in, in Christ and obey the Great Commission. There must be mass evangelism, church planning, Christian discipleship, and explicitly Christian uh, revision of the U.S. Constitution. We need an explicitly Christian revision of the U.S. Constitution and the implementation of an explicitly Christian or biblical law order. That's what we need. That's the solution. You want to stop abortion? You want to stop the AIDS epidemic and its track? You want to stop uh, the widespread growth of homosexuality and cross-dressing and perversions? The answer is Christ. The answer is Christ. It's not natural law. Natural law has never been an answer. Now we're going to take a little break. We're going to come back, and I have a lot more to go on the law. We're talking about the law of Moses. We're talking about uh, the old confessional position, the biblical position, versus Van Drunen's unique dispensational position. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for your holy law. We thank you that you have revealed an ethical standard to us that is perspicuous, that is perfect, that is spiritual, that is holy, righteous, and just. We thank you that it, we can learn how to live in a way that pleases you, that we can show that we love you by keeping your commandments. And we thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name.